everybody, you are very welcome to our 42 courses subscriber only event with Jane Evans. I can see people are joining us here from all over and you will be let in to join. Fantastic to see so many people. Jane Evans, activist, author and champion of midlife women. We're going to be talking about uninvisibility, the multimedia campaign, your fantastic mentoring program that has gone into a pilot program, Visible Start. We're going to be talking about your wealth of experience in uh, marketing and copywriting. Jane Evans, you are very welcome. It's lovely to be here. <laughs> and it was such a pleasure for me uh, when Jane joined to, for this chat this morning. I only know Jane from the 42 Courses copywriting course. So for me to meet Jane, absolutely fantastic opportunity. So Jane, let's just kick off by, for those who have joined today who don't know you, a little bit of a bio, tell everybody about yourself. Okay, so the, 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 um, it's a long, it's a long history. So, <laughs> um, and I will actually start in 1975. Um, 1975, I was a 13 year old schoolgirl about to take my options um, and um, equal opportunity legislation came in. And all of a sudden, I didn't have to be a teacher or a nurse or a secretary. I could be whatever I wanted. I could choose whichever subjects I wanted at school. Um, and I basically took this and ran with it. Um, when I was at school, there was a poster in my biology lab, which was talking about how a fly vomits on your food and then stomps on it and eats it. And then it's your turn. And it was written by Sir Charles Saatchi. And I used to stare at this poster all the time going, that's what I want to do. I want to put words and pictures together, but I didn't know what it was called. I was like, I want to do the posters on the underground. It was, and so, so in those days I went to the library and basically looked up what it was, um, found out it was advertising, found out that there was a course at Ealing that you could study advertising. So I basically found out my route and at 20 years old, I was the first female creative in the creative department at Liga Stellani. Um, so five years later, after a spot at, at KHBB, where I actually had a female creative director, um, I was headhunted out to Australia. Um, and I then spent the next 25 years in Australia. Um, in my advertising career, I ended up as a regional creative director at J. Walter Thompson. I ran the, 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 the local um, award school, which was the training program to get young people into advertising um, and made it, you know, from one woman being in the top 12 to five women being in the top 12. So, you know, have always been fighting for, for, for women and their rights to set up a, um, a, a, a <clears throat> uh, uh, with the advertising federation over there, a thing called COW, which was creative opportunities for women, where we'd get all the women together that were, you know, and, and have inspirational evenings with them. We even had the great Barbara Noakes come out and speak to us, which was absolutely fantastic. Um, but in Australia in 1995, and I, I don't think a lot of people know this, Australia actually was the most progressive in bringing women into creative departments. And I mean, in 1990, I worked in a creative department that actually had 50 50 male and female creative teams, which was absolutely unheard of before or after. Um, but in 1995, we basically dominated the award scene in Australia. We won absolutely everything. Um, and then all of a sudden, 1996, all of our careers were over or we were shipped overseas or we disappeared. Um, my copywriter at the time and I were both taken out to lunch by the local the lead headhunter after we just won like every award in the world thinking that we you know here's the riches lunch with the headhunter um and we got there and they said shit they basically said i i know that you've done absolutely everything but the guys have got together there will never be a female creative director in australia so forget about it um so at that point i was 30 something you know about to hit 35 I wanted to have a family, so I bought a massive, great big warehouse and I started an agency downstairs and I started my family upstairs. Um, and um, we were the 19th most awarded agency in South Pacific region, which for an agency of basically six women and one man 
was pretty incredible. We had clients like Maserati, we had Revlon as a client, um, and we created James Squire, which was Australia's first craft beer. Um, and for everything was going really well, heading to be, you know, Joker 5. Uh, but unfortunately, um, it turned out that I was in a financially abusive relationship. And when the financial abuse was uncovered, uh, basically the physical and emotional abuse st started. So I basically had to throw it all away and start again. So downsized from, you know, a two and a half thousand square meter warehouse to a house with a, a, a stable block out the back to run the business. Um, and for the next 10 years, basically ran a cottage industry. I became known as the, the beer goddess. I think I created something like 18 different craft beer brands um, all around the world. And that was basically all I did. Um, and then my youngest daughter, who's a very talented singer songwriter, got an opportunity to go to music college in, in the UK. My youngest was about to start high school and I was bored shitless of working on beer. Um, I don't drink it. I've never drunk it. I don't like it. Um, well, I was pregnant when I got the account. So it was 18 months later when I finished breastfeeding that they actually discovered that I didn't drink beer. They were like, you've done such a good job. We can't complain now. It was like, but we would have never have given you the account if we'd known that. <laughs> um, and I came back to the UK and um, um, I... Um, <clears throat> And I took my maternity leave. I had three days for both of my children because I ran my own business. Um, so I was like, um, I'm, I'm taking a couple of years off. So I went to the National Film and Television School. I studied um, storytelling for the screen. Um, again, thinking that I was adding to my skill space, you know, with branded content coming in, it was like, you know, great opportunity to, you know, be even better at what I do. And uh, then in 2015, um, the statistic came out that only 3% of the world's creative directors were female. And as probably the most ridiculously overqualified woman for the role, I stuck my hand up very, very loudly and was completely and utterly ignored by the industry. I would have, um, you know, sort of uh, Matt Eastwood, who was the global creative director of J. Walter Thompson, went to the HR woman in London and go, you have to see this woman. The appointment would be made and then it was cancelled and cancelled and cancelled and cancelled. I mean, I had one person that every Monday morning for a year I rang to try and get a new a, 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 a rescheduled appointment. I got through three of her assistants um, and it became a standing joke every Monday with my headhunter of, you know, did you get through? Have you got the appointment? Um, I would go to interviews and I would be met with things like, Jane, I'd give you a job, but you'd end up as the old woman at the back of the creative department doing the shit that nobody else wants. I was told, we'd give you a job, Jane, but we think you'd be bored. And when I said, I don't think I'd ever get bored of putting a roof over my children's head, he sort of looked at me as if I was like a complete fucking weirdo. Um, the upshot of that was, um, you know, after five years of, of you know, or two years of time off and then, uh, you know, further three or four years of not getting any work, I ended up at the food bank. I ended up being evicted and, you know, from from being the absolute top of my career to there. And when I got into the, the food bank, I mean, I looked around and it was like, I mean, it was one of the most horrific experiences of my life. But I looked around and I realized two things. First of all, I was the only woman with all her teeth still. Um, and the other was is that I was the only woman that actually had an opportunity to get out of there. And I walked out of there swearing that I would never go back and swearing that I would do everything in my power to make sure that this didn't happen to other women. So fast forward to January the 23rd, 2019. Um, I think I just got, I'd, I'd just done a new website. And I had a piece of feedback um, with a portfolio on it. And I'd, I'd actually been put forward for a job. I'm like, finally, somebody's actually on my side fighting for me. And then I got the, the, the word back. It was like, oh, we were really excited about her 50 something, you know, a female, you know, amazingness. But there wasn't enough tech savvy, da, 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 and like this whole list of like buzzwords, which was basically saying, we don't mind that she's old, but her work is. And it was like, you, you, you can't win. It was like nobody could see. Nobody was prepared to go back and have a look at 
how progressive my work was. I mean, it was like, I did the first ad ever with a divorced couple. I did the first ad that ever showed a young couple working together. I did the first ad that ever showed men doing housework efficiently. So, you know, it was like, I, you know, I created one of the world's first craft beers, but for some reason, because I hadn't done anything in the last two years, I was irrelevant. Um, so anyway, I woke up one morning and I thought, are there actually any women over the age of 50 creating ads in London? So I put out a tweet um 64 retweeted 64 times um, and i got eight names and i went and met these women and i thought what i was setting up was a um, humans of new york type thing where i go and meet this amazing woman take a photograph tell her story and <clears throat> again when i did this created this new website you know basically the guy turned around going it's unmanageable uh, it's you know it's it, you know basically oh, sorry, um you know, it, it, the, the website, you know, basically criticized the website. Um, a week later, it actually was in one of the top 100 Wix websites in the world, you know, out of 8 million websites. So it was like, you know, I, I knew I could do it still. Um, so so basically, I, I put up the, the tweet. Um, 40 days and 40 nights later, I had built the website. I had found 15 women. I Oh, go away. Um, you're in demand, Jane. Oh, I don't know. Somebody, somebody from Sweden bringing me. Um, I don't know anybody in Sweden. Um, yeah, so I, I found 15 women. I took their photographs. I wrote, wrote their stories. I set up the social media. I had even sent out a press release. And, you know, we had a, a feature in, in um, Virgin on Virgin's website. And in the first two weeks of the campaign, the, the hashtag uninvisibility got two million views. So again, it was like an industry that was telling me I couldn't do it. You know, it was like in 40 days and 40 nights, I did what an agency usually couldn't do in six months. Um, and, but what happened after that was that my inbox absolutely filled with the most horrendous stories. And I'll, I'll just give you three of them because I think they're relevant to advertising. So one of them was a woman, I used to be a PR whiz. I was the top of the town. I now drive a bus. The second one was, I was one of the world's first video jockeys. I was on television every Saturday morning in the, in the 90s. I am now applying for jobs as a hotel maid. The third one was, I was a director at the BBC working in VR. I'm now wiping the ass of an Alzheimer's patient. And it was absolutely, absolutely became absolutely apparent that a woman's career at 45 just hits a cliff and they fall off it and there is no other option for these women other than caring roles and i swear to god if one more person had told me when i was struggling to go and get a fucking job at sainsbury's i was going to hit them because there was just this there is just this perception and it's thousands of years old that once a woman is no longer fertile she has no further use but again one of the things that people were forgetting is as I said at the start, I was 13 years old when equal opportunity legislation came through. I was the generation of the first women that had the choice to have a career. It was like, you know, and, and you know, the women that we're seeing have never been seen before and no narrative has been written for us. And so, you know, we buy 50.3% of all consumer goods. And yet the only time we're ever seen in advertising is in a montage as a whitehead supermodel or as the butt of a as the butt of a joke or as menopausal and there is no narrative for us and the reason why is because we don't exist in advertising agencies we don't exist in cop in, in, in creative departments we don't exist in the clients agencies and the women that are still there are at the top and feeling incredibly lonely unable to do anything about it so you know it, it, we have to start changing the way that we design women's careers again as somebody that you know was there right at the very beginning and is still in here now i'm looking back on it going we have to redesign women's careers because currently it's all based on a man's life expectancy it's all based on a life men, man's biology um and you know no consideration has been taken for women and their lives and again it was like we do 95 percent of the unpaid caring work it was like that figure has not changed in the last 40 years 
so you know it was like if the men don't want to do those caring roles and you know again for us we're actually really very good at those caring roles um so let us do what we're good at but don't let me mean that we have to sacrifice our careers and our futures and you know the facts back it up midlife women have um have half the pension savings of men 48 percent have no pension savings at all so if we don't do something about it now we are going to face a future where you're basically going to have half of the half of the female population retiring in poverty which is um which is totally unacceptable but also if we don't change it now and we're seeing it now i mean i was in a huge thread yesterday with zoe scaman on twitter women are leaving the workforce at an enormous rate since lockdown um, women are going, you know what, I can't be super fucking woman anymore. I can't do this. I am absolutely killing myself. And, I, and, and, and at the end of it, I'm not actually earning anything. Um, and again, they're looking forward going, and why the fuck am I killing myself? Because by the time I'm a teenager, I'm going to have fallen off the ageism cliff. So, you know, it was like, there is never a time when a woman's career doesn't have ageism in it. It was like, for me, at 20, I was too young. Um, even though I'd worked for 10 years, at 30, I was still too young with 10 years experience to, 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 to get the next role. At 35, I was too likely to have children. And at 45, I was too old. I was out. So and that is the current pattern. That is the precedent that has been set and it needs to change. The strength just emanates out of you, Jane. And when we hear your life story, uh the the peaks and the troughs it's not hard now to understand uh, uh how how you've built up that strength i really strongly admire you for it and for coming back when you hit such lows and um as i said that uh i came to know you from the uh course and in fact you tell the story of your first uh, the Australia's first craft beer story and hearing the background now to uh, how you were working on that project really sort of adds depth to it so thanks so much for for being so candid and for sharing all of that and um, I did read the blog on your website um, it runs twice as many women have left the workforce since the pandemic and the comment is good and you're like oh why is this good so please just elaborate on why that is the reaction to this. Because it will actually force this change. We cannot replace these women by younger women. That's putting too much pressure on them and we can't replace them with men. So it is actually going to force and has forced agencies to look at an amazing talent pool of, 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 of an amazing talent pool. Um, yeah, when you say my highs and lows and my story, we have 320 women on this course. I can tell you they've all got my story in one shape or one, one way, shape or form. It was like none of these women have left their careers because it's been their choice. It was like it's been children with special needs, dying husbands, caring, caring for elderly parents. Um, you know, and it's again, if we're going to be looking at these 50 year careers, 50, 60 year careers, we've also got to be looking at the 100 and 120 year lives. And we've got to be looking at what everybody is dealing with at every stage. And we have to redesign careers to, 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 to do something about it. These women that we train at Visible Start, the first three weeks of the course is basically giving these women a massive, great big hug and letting them know that the world has changed and that there is a place for them and letting them build up their confidence because again you know women 55 are the fastest growing group of successful suicides and, the, and because they just you know so many women on this course were just like thank god this was coming along because i didn't know where i was going to go i didn't know what i was going to do i didn't know what to do and you know they come along on the course they all of a sudden realize just how many transferable skills they have um, you know, the women that have left an industry all of a sudden realize that it actually hasn't changed that much. They just need to learn a few acronyms and computer programs. Um, but the actual business and what they're doing hasn't changed in the slightest. And, you know, and again, there's this feeling of I thought it was just happening to me. Uh, when they sit in a room with 200 women all with the same story they're sort of like they get a strength from the fact of oh this is societal this isn't just my unique situation this is this is happening to all of us 
and then you know they go and do the, the you know the technical part of the training and they start going well that wasn't as hard or, or as you know that wasn't as difficult as i thought it was going to be that wasn't anywhere near as daunting as i thought it was going to be and then almost like in the third part of the course they turn into pioneers they strap on the armor and go all right so if we can get back in and rebuild our careers and get to the top we can show these these other women that are leaving now because they're just overwhelmed that they can plateau for their careers that they can take care of their families that they can you know be the caring human beings that they need to be and they can bring all of that experience into what they're doing um, so this is working across the level, um, you know, but the one place that it is not even getting through, there is even not even, an, the conversation hasn't even really started in there, is the creative departments. Uh, they are still basically run by 87% mainly white male ECDs that are not giving up an ounce of their power. Um, they think there's nothing unusual about having just having young women in their creative departments. I'm going, there was only young women in the creative departments in the 80s. There was only young women in the creative departments in the 90s. There was only young women in the creative departments in the 10s. In the 20s, you started having women in their 30s because childcare and everything came so much better. But now they've all left because they just realized your expectations of how much brain space they can give to the job far exceeds what these women are absolutely capable of so you know and and you know you come in with the message of we need to create a new narrative for midlife women um you know and and we've been talking to agencies that we will work with you you know we've brought together a network of the greatest female creatives of our generation all you know massive of awards um you know really passionate about reaching this this target market um, but that message just doesn't get through. So, you know, I, we, we had a situation where there was a, a, a client I'd been speaking to for two years. I'd been speaking to their agency for two years. It was a product for women 50 plus. It was like absolutely like our product. And I finally got a call from them. I'm like, yay, like this. No, they wanted the junior team to present their work to us so for us to check it. And then they wanted to throw a little bit of money at us for social media because they wanted our language. And I told them to fuck off. It was like, I rang my, I rang my business partner. I said, I'm sorry, Jackie, but you know, it was like, I've just told a client to fuck off. And she was like, well, you know, it's not a principle unless it costs you something. It was like, okay, we'll, we'll deal with it. I mean, fortunately, half an hour later, there was, um, they actually emailed us and was like, yeah, we were absolutely wrong. We should have called you in at the beginning. Um, because I basically said to them, if you were working on a product for the black community and you didn't have a single black person in your creative department, would you have the guts to be ringing a black woman now and asking her what she thought? And you could see them all sort of going, no, I wouldn't dare. And I was like, so why are you daring to do it to me? Um, we're starting to get through a little bit now. The strategists are starting to realize that this is such an amazing business opportunity that we should be having midlife women creating this narrative because at the moment we're being observed and we don't want to be observed. We want to create our narrative and, and the way that we're being observed, we're a bit, we keep being kid gloved. It was like, oh dear, we're being talked to like our daughters would talk to. And I always sort of say, you know, if you want a midlife woman, you go and ask my daughter who I am, you'll get a very different story than you will from my best friend. Uh, it was like, you know, if you want to be talking to us, it was like our best friends know how to talk to us. It was like, you know, we're not delicate little flowers. You know, we're old punks. We grew up with young ones. It was like, you know, we, we know how to take the piss out of ourselves. And, you know, things like menopause is a, a massively complicated subject, um, but it could be treated with humor. It could be, you know, at the moment it's all like, <gasps> you've got to go on drugs, you've got to go on drugs. And younger women are like, my God, this looks fucking terrifying. And it was like, we're just sort of looking at it going, well, you know, you're all guessing. You don't have a clue. And it was like, you know, so, um, you know, I, I think that's the point that we really do start to need to get the messaging through. And, you know, people in creative departments, if you get a menopause brief, go, why the, how the fuck do you think I'm going to be able to do this? Why, what, you know, you're not being belligerent by refusing to work on something and saying, I think you should put a midlife woman on that. What you're doing is, is you're guaranteeing your future. 
and you're guaranteeing that your voice is going to be heard because yeah i i don't want to be this i you know i don't want to be observed by younger people it was like i that that's not me and that's not what will make me buy um another champion of the midlife woman who we strongly admire of course is cindy gallup who i know you work with and Cindy did her uh, annual takedown of, uh, I think maybe it was Vogue magazine for the, for the opening advertisements. And um, I'd love to hear your take on maybe uh, who you think is going in the right direction in terms of uh, imagery of this, of, of the midlife woman. I mean, we use these terms very widely, diversity and inclusion, but we're being very much more specific today. Uh, yeah, so, none, none. yeah, is, nobody, is there... nobody, none, none, none. I have been running this project since 2019, and I can honestly say that I have not, I am yet to see a campaign that resonates as a midlife woman. And this is backed up by research. I think um, Bauer Media did some research in 2019 with this group, and they basically came back and said, advertisers and marketers have ignored us for so long, we no longer give a shit what you have to say. Um, it, you know, there's a, 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 some research out for, with, between menopausal women, which all of a sudden midlife women have become menopausal women, which is like, fuck right off. It was like, you know, th that, that's like, you know, calling teenagers puberty. It was like, you don't define teenagers by puberty, do not define midlife women by menopause. Um, but they were saying that, you know, it's, I think something like 67% did not see themselves represented in advertising. We don't see ourselves represented in advertising. Um, and if we, you know, again, the menopause debate, um, you know, I'm doing some work on that at the moment. And, you know, everybody's like, you know, they're all rich, beautiful white women leading this conversation that I don't feel like her. That, that she doesn't relate to me in the slightest. You know, I'm, I'm a midlife woman that's you know, fucking dying here, <laughs> having having hot flushes, you know, three times a day. It was like feeling ugly, dowdy in the crone stage. You know, the last thing I need is Penny Lancaster strutting along, telling me I've got to have a fucking marvellous menopause. And, you know, and for me as somebody that, um, actually is not in the slightest bit afraid of aging. I actually relish it. I love it. I'm, I'm fascinated to see who I become, who my face becomes. It's like I am enjoying watching the journey of who I become as I grow older. The debate is being led by women who are terrified of aging, um, who are doing it because, you know, they, they want their skin to stay younger. And, you know, and, and what they're doing is actually extending menopause for such a length of time that you know it never really gets bad but it also never really gets over and again it was like you know when you're talking about the menopause debate go and talk to the women who got to the other side of it because i tell you it is fucking amazing on this side which again nobody gets that message because we're not around we're not telling our stories we're not leading the narrative you know i say to younger women imagine waking up every single day and you feel exactly the same it was like every single emotion that you have is completely and utterly valid. It's like your boobs never hurt, not once, not ever. Um, you get a, a lift of confidence, like you get a but you get a shot of testosterone. And I remember, you know, when I got my shot of testosterone, I went, "Holy shit! This is what David Droger felt like at 22." It was like. Um, and, you know, again, all of that for creative women, all that creativity that used to go down there, all of a sudden comes up here. You are inspired like never before. And again, this is a target market that nobody's talking about is the, the, the reinvention of midlife women. Because, yes, they go through the menopause stage and the stages of that. I mean, you know, there's, a, there's actually a, a stage called the crone stage, which is when you really don't give a shit what you look like. My daughters were like, mum, you're buying your clothes at Sainsbury's. What, you know, it was like, you, that's not you. It's like, you know, what is going on here? I was like, I didn't care. It was like a pair of black, tra you know, tracky pants and hair in a ponytail. I really, really didn't give a stuff. But when I got the boost of testosterone, when, and again, when all of a sudden I had this feeling of, I have no chemicals running through my body anymore. It was like, Holy shit. My, my, my appreciation for women went absolutely through the roof because the things that we put up with without absolutely naturally every single day without thinking about it 
when all of a sudden they're gone, it was like the freedom and the space was just incredible. So again, this is a, st a stage of life, which, you know, these women have the money, we buy everything. And here we are at a stage where we're reinventing ourselves. It was like, everybody talks about, you know, talking to the youth because they will be changing their looks and buying more clothes. I swear to God, women in their fifties, almost everyone I know, has gone, actually, you know what, hold on a minute, I need to, who am I now? Who am I going forward? Tell me a little bit about how your book came about, Invisible to Invaluable, Unleashing the Power of Midlife Women with Carol Russell. Um, when did you think to yourself, I, I could write a book about this? So it started out. It started out as a fifteen thousand word book, which um, which was basically the manifesto for for uninvisibility. So I actually wrote it as you know. I knew I was going out talking. I knew that this was a new subject. So it basically started out as a manifesto for midlife women. Um, I was just got the um, my publishing deal, um, and then lockdown came. And a lot of the things that I'd written in the book, like running a family is like running a business, previously had been hypothetical. But all of a sudden in lockdown, everybody was starting to see practically, they could actually see it with their own eyes that running a family was like running a business. And there were so many things happening with lockdown happening that I was like, I actually have to rip this up and start again. Um, then George Floyd happened. And, you know, I just went, you know what, the last thing the world needs is another book by a white middle-class feminist. And if this is going to be a manifesto for all my midlife women, it's got to be a manifesto with more than one voice. Um, and so Carol and I had actually studied at the National Film and Television School together. We absolutely bonded on day one. And if you've read the book, you'll see a, a very spiritual, you know, coincidentally, woo connection. Um, and um, we, um, we basically had a rule after that, that we wouldn't answer the phone to each other unless we had three hours to spare, because we would just put the worlds to right. So everything that I'd written in that manifesto, I had basically discussed, you know, head to toe with Carol anyway. So we basically were both sitting down, it was locked down, and we basically spent the summer um, expanding on it, growing it, um, you know, finding other stories to add in there again, so that it could be, you know, every midlife woman's story. Um, and so we, we wrote it, um, I think we got the publishing deal in June and we delivered the first um, galley um, at, um, in September and uh, finished book written by the end of, uh, end of December and then out in May. So um, yeah, it was, and it's been, an, it's been an incredible success. It's going into its second print run. Um, and I noticed there's quite a few men on this course, please, Go and read it. Um, and if you don't want to read it, get the audio book, uh, because seriously, every man that has read it so far has absolutely loved it. Um, and we don't blame you in any way, shape or form, but we do explain the patriarchy and how the patriarchy has gone against us. And I think it's just as important for men to understand that we are fighting thousands of years. You know, uh, we, we, we're from, the, you know, particularly midlife women are fighting an image that, that you know, as I said before, fertile, non-fertile women have no place in society. So, you know, it was like, we go right back to the beginning. It was like, you know, we, we go right the way back. Um, and explain, uh, you know, a, a, a white women's career journeys. We explain black women's career journeys. We explain, you know, the, the patriarchy from a white woman's point of view. You know, when you add patriarchy to a black woman's, it adds so much more to the mix. Um, and but we also, you know, um, found stories of women's stories that we could scatter through it that would help these women with their life experience. And my favorite story in the whole book is, is, is a friend of mine that I've had since 17, 17 years old. We were writing a book for women in lockdown, in lockdown, and we found women who had been in lockdown for five years. Um, and this was a friend in Palestine who basically had gone through the intifada with her family, all like stuck in the house for five years. Um, and her and her sister actually started a school 
to let children come to school and they had 50 children every day crawling along the ground to get to school so again it was like we tried to find as many you know and, and and for me that was the most important story in the book was you know you've just done a couple of years of lockdown but imagine you know walking out you couldn't walk out the front door because you'd get shot and you know imagine what it would be like for children so desperate to learn and escape this that they would crawl along the ground to get there was really quite amazing so um, yeah, so it's a rollicking good story. There's there's lots of really good reads in there. But I think, again, for men to, you know, we need as many allies as we can at the moment because we need to change this attitude now. It was like every year that we delay on this, another generation of women, um, um, uh, another um, generation of women are being lost. I just noticed you, you asked me about my Clio Award. I inherited this. <laughs> this is not mine. I didn't win it. It's one of the ones that was stolen on the year that Clio's went. The, 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 I think in the late 90s, they had a disastrous Clio Awards. And um, apparently there was just like a table of Clio's and everybody went up and stormed the stage and just took them. Um, and so this is this is one of the stolen ones that I inherited from a friend who stole it. <laughs> um, so uh, I noticed as well that you'd obviously got huge plaudits for for the work. Um, I I think you were particularly proud. Was it Bernadine um, Evaristo, the, the novelist? Uh, record well, prize winner. I mean, just absolutely amazing to have that kind of recognition. So maybe as well, you'd just share, you know, some of the responses to the book that you got. Oh, look, you know, there were women saying, "I've got," you know, I, I'm, "I'm actually going to have to see the chiropractor because my head was nodding so much." Um, you know, it was, you know, other women and, and a lovely story the other day. So a woman on our course was like, "I asked a, a male friend of mine to buy this book for me." Um, and, um, and he, he, he was like, I, he was a 30 year old man. And he was like, before I sent it to you, I wanted to read it, um, because like, so that I could understand you better. And he was like, I was laughing. I was crying. I absolutely adore that. I can't wait for you to read the book so we can share it. So I think there's a great surprise. I think there's a great surprise at how much humor there is in the book. Um, and, you know, again, if you listen to the audio book, Carol and I actually, you know, narrated it um, and you can actually really sense the friendship in it. It was like, you know, uh, uh, Bernardina Avaristo, you know, the Booker Prize winner was like, I felt like I was in the room while Jane and Carol were having those conversations. And I think, again, you know, if you look at it widely as well, is, you know, we've had difficult conversations. It was like, you know, there have been times that Carol's just gone, Jane, you are not listening to me. I am not speaking to you for three weeks. You are so wrong on this. And, you know, she put me in time out because, you know, I would ask the difficult questions. I would be like, I need to understand what is the difference between your experience and my experience? What is the black woman's experience? as an ally what can i do to help so you know we've actually you know this book is built on us having those difficult conversations and i think we should all be having these really lovely open conversations where we can really get to understand each other um and and that that the, we're the ones that are making the effort to learn rather than expecting our you know diverse friends to do all of the hard heavy lifting it was like you know so i think it's a great lesson in learning how to do the heavy lifting and how to share a voice obviously we've all been through men and women life-changing events in the last few years and uh, for many people it has been new opportunities have found their way into how people created new things for themselves for other people it's been hugely detrimental but I just wondered what you felt uh has been sort of the the biggest benefit for for yourself from this what, what did you feel you learned from this period of time we've had time in ourselves oh, having to reinvent ourselves it was an absolute freaking godsend for us um it was you know it was um it came like so so the, the, i think the january before lockdown um we actually had to run a gofundme for women in in visible in, in uninvisibility because you know one was getting evicted me um another was um she couldn't afford to go bankrupt she didn't have the 600 pounds to actually officially go bankrupt 
um, and another one couldn't afford the rent on a council flat. It was, you know, it was, we, we were absolutely at crunch point. Um, <clears throat> and then came lockdown and everything, everything just sort of like quietened down and slowed down and everybody started thinking about things and everybody started looking at things differently. And, you know, I think it was, and as I said, you know, a lot of the things that we'd been saying um, started to, people started to really understand. I think people started to really understand work-life balance. And, you know, and again, it was like my generation, one of the things that we faced was we had as much opposition about us working from women as we did from men. So there was very much a, you know, either you're a mother or you have a career. Because if you had, if you were a mother that tried to have a career, you were sneered at at the at, at the gates. You know, you can't. You know, it was. We 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 really did face it from every angle. Um, but it was interesting. A couple of years before I wrote the book, I was working with a client, and and they base and they were saying, you know, women these days feel as though they have to have a career. And at the time, I was like, what the, like this. But during lockdown, I realized that most of these women had actually grown up with mothers who had worked and that there was this feeling that you go to university, you have a career, you do this. And there was never the option of just being a mother. It had just been completely wiped out for us. It was a choice and like a really horrendous week. Now, which which one are you going to choose? But for them, there was no choice. You, you have your career and you try and be superwoman. And I think what happened in lockdown is, first of all, women were forced to spend time with their children. They couldn't throw them off to grandma. They couldn't send them to school. They couldn't send them to childcare. So they were actually forced to be with their kids 24 hours a day. And I think they loved it. I think they started really enjoying it. I think they also saw how much their children got out of it, that they started to see their children flourish. And then I think they started looking at it going, hold on a minute. I'm paying this much to commute to work every day. I'm spending this much on coffee every day. I'm spending this much on lunches every day. I'm spending this much on clothes because I've got to have five different fucking outfits every week. Um, you know, I'm spending this much on makeup. I'm spending this much on my hair. I'm spending this much on my nails. And then looking at it and they're going, you know, even women with a massive salary are going, well, I'm paying for is the bloody summer holiday every year. It was like, you know, and I think there was a real sense of actually, you know what, this is I'm killing myself here. And that is why we've got the great talent shortage now is is because these women have just gone this working isn't worth it. It's just not worth it. But for the for for us, the women that are like, well, our kids have gone off to university. It was like, you know, I haven't been able to do anything for a while. I'm ready to get back in is you know a great opportunity for us to be able to do that and if we can actually start to build this as part of the career path for women that we can see this burst of energy that comes for us um you know and again you know really easy to retrain it's like you don't need to send us to university for three you can send us on an eight-week course that's all we need to do to retrain um and you know the women that have gone into wpp are loved and adored it was like, you know, everybody is really, you know, we, we did an event with Mark Reed the other week and he just couldn't understand. You know, yeah, I think everybody was just blown away at how welcome these women would be, how everybody admired them, loved them, having them around. Um, and, you know, again, it was um, we had 200 mentors with Mediacom mentoring these women. And at the end of the course, they all said they learned more from the women than they taught. And that they had absolutely changed their attitude on these women. If those women that we trained went outside of that agency where we had changed or that ecosystem where we had changed the narrative, they went back to facing the same old shit. They were being interviewed with their cameras off. Oh, sorry, what? Hold on, delivery. <laughs> I'll just uh, fill in there whilst Jane goes to the door. We're just going to be asking her a few more questions when she comes back. And I think we'll be asking her about possibly her own mentors. Uh, Irene's got a question in a minute. I uh, don't know who that was, but I just Hello, Jane, pressed, pressed welcome the back. so they can come in. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just, Jane, going to, just diverting there now whilst you went to the door. Uh, we've got lots of uh, the crew from 42 uh, with us here today, Irene and Jake and Chris. Um, Irene had a lovely question early on, and I maybe I'll ask Irene to join us 
to put the question uh, to you herself uh, about your inspiration. So would you like to uh, join us, Irene? Yes, I can. I actually think it, it might be Jake's question, but I'm happy to, <laughs> to answer oh, it. I think we're both locked in as Irene. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to ask it. So um, we wanted to know what are some of your top tips for having difficult conversations? Listen, listen, listen. Understand the other side. So I had a friend um, who was the absolute epitome of everything I hated in advertising. He was the, the alcoholic, creative director, you know, just sexist, ageist, the works. Um, but we got thrown together by by fate. He came back from the to the UK because his mother was dying. Um, and we got together because he was lonely and I was broke. And so we go once a month to the theatre or an art gallery. And so these sort of like two complete opposites, the feminist and the old ad guy, um, you know, would actually see each other once a month. And um, then came me too. And my, my ex copywriter is Jane Caro. She went on to become a media commentator. She um, ran for Senate. She's an author. I mean, she's you know, a, a, a big celebrity in, in, in Australia. And Terry was so proud that he knew Jane Caro. And he was like, she's going to be prime minister. I'm going to know the prime minister of Australia one. He was so proud to know her. Anyway, he put something up on me too, that she basically blocked him. And all, every woman in advertising in Australia blocked him for it. And he was beside himself. He didn't, he couldn't understand it. He really, really, really could not get to grips with it. And basically for the next three months, it was like a little bit of time. I just gave him a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And I understood where he was coming from because I lived in that world. It was like, I was there and he was like, you know, we had it just as hard as you did. It was like, you know, it was so competitive. It was like, you know, it wasn't great for any of us. And that was his attitude. It was, you know, we were all in there fighting together. It was like, what disadvantage did you have? And, you know, it was like stories will come out and then uh, and it gave me the opportunity when he was telling the stories. So, you know, at one stage he was like, oh, you know, it was, wasn't it great the days. You know, I remember there was one agency, there were two creative directors used to get the production assistant to give her blowjobs under the desk. Well, the look on my face, it was like he could see like my chin wobbling and, you know, just he could see the visceral reaction that that had with me. I was like, do you realize you're still abusing that woman 30 years later? And I was like, um, what did you do about it? And he was like, oh, well, you know, I looked after her and gave her a cuddle. And I was like, no, you were being the good guys. I said, what did you say to the guys that were demanding that she gave him a blowjob under your desk? Oh, now you're making me feel bad. And it was like, yeah, sorry. Um, you know, I think you've got to be able to listen to their understand, listen to their experience and actually put yourself where they are and what their mindset was. So he was like, well, I never got as far as I could. I was always being fired. It was always really competitive for me. I was always up against it. You know, what more difficulty did you have? And it was just gradually every little bit, just like, and it finally got to the end. And, 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 and the point in the end was he basically, I said to him, I said, all right, Terry, you know, you and I, we see each other as equals, you know, it was, I probably won a few more awards than him, but it was like, you know, we, 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 we um, you know, we were seen as equals. I said, what was the most you ever earned in advertising? It was four times what I earned. It was four times. And and he just, at that point, he was like, he couldn't work out why I was broken. He was happily retired. And it was at that point that he was like, ah, oh, right, okay, now, now I see it. So I think it's like, I think about having the long convers about having the conversations. Be prepared to have really long conversations. These things are not going to be. You're not going to get through to these in one or two conversations. You know, Carol and I. You know, seven years of discussing the difference between white careers and black careers, and the you know the experience of being a black woman. You know, with Terry, it was six months of what does me too actually mean. Um, so, you know, I, I think we've got to be prepared to have the long conversations. Thanks so much, uh, Irene and Jake, for <laughs> your questions. Uh, and so just we're coming towards the end of uh, our chat now, Jane, and it's really been very illuminating. Just before we go, I do want to bring Chris in to 
put a couple of questions to you. Uh, so Chris, I'll just ask you to join us. Hi. <laughs> Hi Chris, how are you? Very well, very well. You're looking even better than when I last saw you. Congratulations. I'm not my dressing gown this time. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realise they were filming me last time. I turned up in my dressing gown. <laughs> It was a good look. It's a good look. I was, uh, I was just saying, I was just chatting to Steve Harrison, and um, he said to send his best. And then Giles um, Edwards as well said that you're like one of his favorite favorite speakers. I was just saying, it's it's so nice listening to you. Your energy is like, uh, oh, it's, it's amazing. Um, so thank you. Um, look, I think the thing is, is you know, uh, one of the things I didn't say was that my whole life, the one thing that I'd always been able to rely on was my talent. So when I found out that that was failing me, I just really did get to the point of like, if I can become fucking invisible, what hope does anybody else have? So, you know, for somebody that has always had a, a brief in my head and always had a client to work up, it was like to not have a brief and a client was like, I was going crazy. So, you know, I made the decision that midlife women are my client, uh, midlife women are my brief. And, you know, it's really easy to be passionate about mm. something that, you know, you can, you can actually make, you know, a, we are making a difference in lots of women's, hundreds of women's lives at the moment. I want to make that thousands. I want to make that millions. Um, and I want, you know, I, I, as I said, I don't want any woman having to go through what I went through because it's horrendous. You know, fortunately, mm -hmm. I'm strong and tough and have got the have got the tools to to do something about it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I can't even start to imagine what it would feel like if you didn't. Yeah, that's um, well, I mean, yeah, it's amazing. I, 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 I know my, my wife really wanted to join this call, but she's in Singapore and it's really late. But um, <laughs> she, she's looking after diversity and inclusion for Boeing. Uh, so she wanted to get in touch. But anyway, I can sort that out after this. Um, <laughs> yeah, get in touch, definitely. <laughs> what, what was the, um, I mean, what's the sort of uh, the, the most favourite piece of work that, you, that, you've, that you've worked on? I mean, I... I, I maybe it's the book i don't know maybe it's the the, the organization but i is, is there a from an ad point of view is there something that you worked on that you really loved i know you did some great stuff okay so the greatest creative project of my life has been my children right and i think that everybody should actually be able to recognize that particularly for creative people you're, mm. you you the, there is no creative project on this planet there is no brief there is nothing that 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 beats that and we should be given time to be able to do that as well um i am very proud of creating james squire beer um mm. you know it was we created it in 1997 there was no such thing as craft beers um you know i was i led the whole team i designed it you know worked with the amazing jack vaughan who wrote all the copy which again is you know one of my absolute heroes um you know i you know to be able to work with australia's top copywriter was incredible um i um but i think the thing that i am most proud of is visible start yeah. it was you know we, we've got 20 women 19 women employed at wpp agencies i think you know we probably changed the lot you know actually physically changed the lives of about 35 women other women got jobs set up freelance businesses just regained their confidence uh we're now doing the same with um 320 women on the course um, and, you know, that to me is what I'm most proud of. Uh, but I think, you know, as a creative person, I haven't done the work I'm the most proud of yet. It's still to come. Um, and, you know, that's, um, I love this. This is one of my favorite. These are my, you were asking about, these are my two favorite mm -hmm. awards. So in 2019, I won this one, which is BNT Women in Media Awards and Lifetime Achievement Award. Oh, wow. which was absolutely fantastic but the next year from added age i got women to watch europe nice. and to me that is like the absolute these are the two my two favorite awards because that was like the end of my first career and this is the start of my second so um you know i and, and when i when i you know, accepted the bnt award i said you know i'm sorry i'm going to rewrite this i'm a copywriter it was like you know this is half a lifetime's achievement award it was like i've only just started so you know i think any creative any creative worth her salt um is still like even everything that i've done there's still something better to come there's still you know there's still yeah. 
there's there's still something else you know and i think that is you know again when we talk about age it was like we shouldn't be talking about age we should be talking about drive you know there is the, yeah. you know, i still yeah I, I, when you asked you know are there any great representations of midlife women no haven't seen one not one not ever there is not a campaign i was i because i'm gonna turn well to it it was <laughs> like you know but well, we've got to get through the messages to the clients that a we exist because they don't believe that we exist they've been told that there are no such thing as as you know midlife female creatives um, and, you know, somebody's just got to be able to look at our work from 20 years ago, go, fucking hell, they were amazing then. Let's give them some budget. What are they going to do now? I hope so. I mean, things always go sort of cyclical, don't they? And I think there's there's so many, uh, there's so much you can learn from the stuff that's been done before. I think you often learn probably more from it, just for, whether it's from advertising or from anything in life. There's often greatness to be found in that. I think also we're starting to get to the crest of the wave. I, we are actually starting to work on projects. We are actually starting to have clients talking to us. Mm-hmm. And, I, and again, it was like, you know, because we're not working in there, everybody's recognised that we're an important consumer group and they've just gone with the first idea, which is menopause. Oh, well, how do we talk to this important consumer group? What, you know, it was like first idea, menopause. It was like the reality is, is menopause is this much of our lives. It might be this much if you have it badly, but you know, again, we did a poll. Um, you know, six percent said that menopause had affected their lives. Twenty-nine percent gendered ageism. Forty-seven percent unpaid caring responsibilities. Um, so you know, it was like so. The conversation has started. There is now starting to be a bit of a backlash on the the menopause exploitation. There's articles of you know, and you know, for me, it was like you know, I've been saying for three years. Please, God, do not do menopause ads about us because all you're going to do is create a brand new stereotype of mad, crazy, sweaty ladies, which is actually going to make everything worse for us. Mm. And lo and behold, we just see mad, crazy, sweaty ladies, which again is just going to exacerbate our problems. But fortunately, there do seem to be a lot of clients out there. Again, a lot of midlife women Mm. at the very top feeling very lonely. Um, mm-hmm. are actually going, hold on a minute, the, the, you know, we've got to do something with this, the most, in, in, the, the biggest consumer group on the planet. Um, why don't we start treating them with some respect? And yes, all right, we've, 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 we've let them know that, that there's resources for menopause, but, you know, it was like, let's open the rest of the world up. I can't wait to see the work. Good luck. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> thanks Chris. Gonna get the brief first. <laughs> thanks so much, Chris. And we've come to the end of our session. It's been truly enlightening to speak to you, Jane. You're just oozing energy and power. And I feel like I need to send you a, a Superwoman T-shirt or, or, or something like that. But it's just been an absolute joy to speak to you. Thank you so much for joining us today on our 42 Courses uh, subscriber and speaker series and uh, you are welcome back at any time so it's just to say thank you very much Jane Evans for joining us today excellent thank lovely. you so much lovely to see you all so thank lovely. you so Bye. much Jane. <laughs> Cheers, Jane have a lovely day